If you look at these cabinet appointees, they were selected for a reason, and that is the deconstruction of the administrative state. And if you... Before he left the Trump administration, former advisor Steve Bannon famously vowed to deconstruct what he called the administrative state, that collection of bureaucrats, agencies, and unelected rulemaking bodies whose decrees govern more and more of our lives. Cutting regulations and policies that come not directly from Congress, but from administrators who decide, say, that the FCC has the ability to regulate the Internet under rules originally created for public utilities. President Trump's appointee to the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch, is a critic of the administrative state, too, questioning the legal validity of rules laid out by bureaucracies in some of his best-known rulings. And so far, many of the president's picks at places such as the FCC, the FDA, the EPA, and the Department of Education seem to be doing just that. I view it as the leading threat to civil liberties uh, of our era. I recently sat down with Columbia Law School's Philip Hamburger to discuss whether the administrative state is a threat to freedom and representative government. He's one of the leading critics of the administrative state and the author, most recently, of The Administrative Threat. And Philip Hamburger, thank you for talking. Thank you for having me here. Let's start by defining uh, administrative law in the administrative state. Uh, what does it do and where does it come from? Right. So administrative power can be understood in many different ways. Some people use the phrase to describe all government power in the executive, and that's rather too broad. It's indiscriminate. I use the phrase to describe what I was really sort of extra legal rulemaking and adjudication, the exercise of power to bind Americans, to control Americans, not through the pathway set up by the Constitution, namely acts of Congress and acts of the court, but through other edicts, uh, typically from agencies. In your uh, recent book, uh, Is Administrative Law Unlawful? You liken the practice of administrative law to uh, off-road driving, and you write, the problem examined here is thus not where the government is heading, but how it drives. To leave the roads laid out by the Constitution can be exhilarating, at least for those in the driver's seat. All the same, it is unlawful and dangerous. Um, so administrative power, it's not Congress doesn't make a law and then it gets implemented. That's not administrative power. Congress passes a law and then it, you know, that says we want clean air. And then the EPA says, OK, in order to implement that law, we're coming up with all of these different aspects. Right. The, the, the danger is in what the agencies do. Congress certainly has power to enact all sorts of laws regulating us. And so this is not an argument against regulation. We can debate the merits of particular regulations. Uh, but rather, it's an argument against uh, having the executive or independent agencies, which are more or less part of the executive, uh, make rules that bind us in the same manner as laws enacted by Congress. But they're not subject to the same kind of public discussion or vote, uh, you know, or rep So is the administrative state bad because it, it ends the separation of powers, because the executive branch gets to make more and more decisions, or, or maybe and or it's bad because the rules can't really be, you know, they're implemented in a non-democratic or non-representative right. way? I, I view it as the leading threat to civil liberties uh, of our era. Uh, we have a republic, we still have a republic established by the Constitution, meaning we have a system of government in which our laws are made by the folks we elect, and these laws are enforced by judges and juries in the courts. But we have within that an administrative state, a state that acts really by mere command, not mm -hmm. through law, and that adjudicates not in courts with judges and juries, but through its own tribunals. So for you, that's that parallel government that worries me. You know, what are leading examples for you, or you know, the most current telling examples of the administrative state? Right. So one can find this in most agencies. Agencies get a loose instruction from Congress, for example, make air clean. And then the agency will define clean and make a host of rules requiring how we should regulate our, our lives and our businesses and our farms and the rest. Uh, these rules are not enacted by Congress, and that's why this is really a civil liberties problem. We should be able to live under rules made by the folks we elect. That's the whole point of having a republic. But well, to think about something like the Clean Air Act or whatever, I mean, you know, these are massive laws. And what, what, how do you answer critics who say, well, of course you're going to give, you know, you're going to kind of push a lot of the responsibility for actually writing up the rules that implement the goals of the law, to bureaucrats, because I mean, you don't want—I uh, don't know—you know who's your least favorite congressman. You don't want him defining pollution for you, right? 
There's, a, there's a, a danger of error in Congress. There are perhaps 500 sources of error in Congress. <laughs> Uh, and there's only one source of error perhaps in an agency. But in fact, that makes it all the more desirable to have this done in Congress because there's also a chance that the folks will get it right. Mm -hmm. Whereas in an agency, there's great danger of a single point of view being imposed that isn't really responsive to the people. The reality is that we had a revolution and we established a constitution as a great experiment in human history mm -hmm. to see if we can govern ourselves. And to create an alternative system of government which looks more monarchical, which is a matter of almost military command, is really a, a profound departure and a denial of everything we expect when we seek equal voting rights and the rest. When, uh, you know, in looking at administrative, uh, the administrative state or the, the rise of administrative law, a lot of people point back to a 1984 case that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, that was uh, Chevron versus, what was it, the National Resources Defense Council, or could you explain that? And is that what, is that the, the kind of original sin of the administrative state? Oh, it's by no means the original sin. Yeah. It's just one of many, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, but it is, what, it, it is a type of deference, of judicial deference to agencies. Uh, agencies acquire lawmaking power uh, by express authority from Congress, but sometimes Congress doesn't give them authority, nonetheless they take it to make rules where they say that the statute is ambiguous mm -hmm. and therefore in order to interpret it, they have to uh, fill in the gaps as it were. And that's what she the Chevron case really allows and systematizes. And the awkwardness of all of this is that uh, where, the government, the, where the government is a party to a case, uh, the judges, uh, when they defer to the agency's interpretation of a statute, are in fact adopting the legal position of one of the parties in the case before them. Mm -hmm. In other words, the judges become systematically biased. Uh, it's really a, a, a genuine civil liberties problem because our procedural rights are the bulk of the Bill of Rights. And primary amongst these is due process of law and jury rights. Now when a case that's decided by administrative tribunal comes up before a court, what does a judge do? The judge will defer to the agency in the facts and defer to the agency in the law under cases like Chevron. And the result is systematic bias even in the courts. So the problem is, isn't just the agency but the courts themselves. Is the bias always towards uh, kind of, is it always towards the, uh, the, the experts? The, you know, is it a part of the cult of the experts or is it results driven? Um, or is it both, I guess? Um, for the courts, I suspect it's principled in some secondary sense, not high principles of due process and jury rights, which are thrown aside, but principled in the sense that they don't feel competent to make these decisions themselves and they'd rather leave the interpretation to the experts. Um, the awkwardness is that they're there by allowing agencies to make law and the judges themselves are abandoning their independent judgment and in fact being biased in favor of the government. So in something like the Chevron case, would you have preferred or would a better outcome have been for the courts to say, you know what, we, we can't interpret this, but neither should the agency and they should somehow kick it back to Congress to say, if you want clean air, you gotta be more specific in the way you write laws? There's no need for the judges to defer to the agencies. If they cannot find meaning in a statute, yes, they should just let it go. <laughs> Exactly. What um, is the in in the uh, one of the things that uh, Trump's uh, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has done is she's uh, she's changing the definition of a uh, uh, of a uh, policy that came out of the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education, uh, a dear colleague letter that you know suggested a lower level of proof for uh, cases of uh, of assault sexual assault on campus, the creation of hostile workplaces. Is that the type of administrative law that's problematic? Right. So that's yet another mode of making rules by uh, by agencies. Um, at least in their formal room, in, in much of their rulemaking, the agencies will follow various administrative procedures to create the rule. Uh, very often, in fact, increasingly, uh, one finds administrative power as an evasion even of administrative limits on rulemaking and guidance falls into that category. Yeah. There, the agencies will interpret their own rules and issue mere guidance. It's a gentle hint, a uh, governance by, uh, by a wink and a nod, not even by rulemaking. So what, what is driving this if it's not specific legal rulings, or rather they kind of are mileposts towards a, a, a vaster and vaster administrative state? Who's setting that direction that we seem to be 
we keep driving towards. So Gary Lawson, a scholar at Boston University, has noted the rise and rise of the administrative state. The administrative power always seems to expand, whether under Democrats or Republicans. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for this is one has to think of administrative power really as an evasion of regular pathways. First, an evasion of constitutional pathways mm -hmm. for making law and adjudicating, and then even an evasion of administrative pathways. You get ever less formal modes of binding Americans, of commanding Americans and telling them what to do. This is just the natural progress, I think, of power always to escape its limits. Well, you've made uh, an argument, though, also, or, or rather it's a provocative coincidence, or maybe not a coincidence, but that as, um, as the, uh, the vote expands to include more and more people who are seen as less and less, maybe perhaps less and less deserving of the vote or less and less knowledgeable, uh, so right at the time where people without property get enfranchised, women, blacks, et cetera, um, their votes count for less and less because the administrative state is calling all the shots. Is there, it, you know, is that just a coincidence or is there something more sinister there's a very, going on? There's a very disturbing linkage between these two developments. If you think of the main two developments in American law since the Civil War, one has been equal voting rights and the other one has been in the administrative state. And so are they connected? Maybe they are. Uh, what I think happened was that as we got increasing suffrage for blacks, for women, um, and then not just as a formality, but as a reality in the 1960s, uh, the knowledge class, uh, those persons who felt a sort of attachment to their abstract academic knowledge rather than to local hierarchies of representative mm -hmm. government, uh, became very disturbed by the results. They were happy to see equal voting, but they didn't like the results. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson's quite explicit about mm -hmm. this. He says it's very difficult for progressive performers to persuade uh, persons who are not of the older stocks, as he puts it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he specifies persons who are, for example, Irishmen, Germans, and Negroes. Uh, now, this racist element, I think, is not central. Uh, what actually is driving this is a disdain for governance by the unwashed masses. Right. And I, I assume there must be records of this, but the progressive must have been when women get the vote and then they vote for Warren G. Harding. It's like, what were we thinking, <laughs> right? Because no progressive wanted him, you know, a thousand miles within the White House. Right. There's a very disturbing degree to which administrative power tends to increase 15 years or so after each expansion of suffrage. 1870, mm -hmm. blacks get the right to vote. 1880s, we get the first federal agency. Mm -hmm. uh, 1920, women get the right to vote. 1930s, we get a further expansion right. of the administrative state, 1960s and so forth. Well, well can I ask, uh, so did the administrative state expand? Uh, if, if you look at the Civil Rights Acts and Voting Rights Acts of the mid-60s, when Ronald Reagan hits, did the administrative state expand under him? It, it expands really in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So it's not long after oh, the tumult of the 60s, right. we get administrative state and therefore more orderly mode of governance that suits the knowledge class. Right. I don't think there was a conspiracy here. It's just the natural progress of events, but it constitutes really one of the profound, a profound bait and switch of a sort that we really need to take notice of. The administrative threat is the greater, is the greater, the administrative power is the greatest threat to equal voting rights mm -hmm. because it allows you the formality of electing your representatives, but takes away administrative mm -hmm. power and places it in safer hands, as it were. Are people, uh, are even people who support the administrative state openly, are they actually, are, are they kind of in the, uh, in the same way that there are mostly fair weather federalists, uh, people say, uh, you know, what I, I want to, you know, I want to devolve power down to a lower set of government that's closer to the to the place where the rules are taking place, et cetera. Very few people are principled federalists. The Republicans and Democratic parties will switch sides on states' rights or devolving power whenever it suits the outcome they want. Uh, even John C. Calhoun was a fair weather federalist or states' writer. Is that true also of the administrative state? Um, it may be true, I think, of m a large number of politicians. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't surveyed it. I, yeah. don't, I don't really know, but one suspects so. Certainly, uh, Republic, you know, Democrats are not the only supporters of the administrative right. state. Most Republicans probably are, too. Uh, the real division isn't politics, nor even ultimately race, um, although I do think minorities get terribly hurt by the administrative state mm -hmm. and its homogenizing tendencies. Uh, the real division is class. Uh, the knowledge class appreciates the sort of power that's exercised by people, well, like themselves. And uh, that's less obvious to persons who aren't members of that class or who are minorities that get hurt by the administrative state. 
Um, do you take uh, Donald Trump, and obviously it was Bannon who famously said he wants to deconstruct the administrative state. Trump uh, is an interesting case then because in many ways he, he, you know, he's the second coming of Andrew Jackson. He's a very commanding person who wants, you know, he even wants the NFL to change its policies based on his, you know, blood sugar levels at a given moment. Um, is he, do you think, is he good to, is he good on his promise to kind of get rid of the administrative state or hold it back? Well, we've yet to see. Mm -hmm. um, thus far, there have been great many rules that have been overturned, but overturning a rule one way or another isn't really the point. Uh, this is not an argument for the merits of one right. regulation or another. Uh, the real test will be, will he cut back on the power, the types of power that could be used by either party uh, for good or for ill, mm -hmm. but in the long term for great ill because it undermines our constitutional system of government. Well, uh, do, can you lay a wager there? Do you, are you confident or, <laughs> or are you optimistic? I have no that, idea. I have yeah. no idea, but I look forward to seeing. It'll be interesting. Well, that's, that's a cop-out, but we'll, well, okay. we'll so, stick with that. Um, I, yeah. I, I'm a lawyer, right. and <laughs> I, I place trust, although many politicians can do good things, I place trust yeah. actually in litigation. And that's different, right? I mean, in, in terms of some critics of the administrative state, uh, and uh, Charles Murray, uh, the writer and uh, a scholar at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, has written a lot about this, and he has called for a kind of judicial attack or using the courts to gum up uh, the ability of agencies to pass laws. But you critique him in, in, your, in your writing. You say that he's less interested in the process and more in the outcome. Is that accurate? I, I think Charles Murray is very worried about the economic costs mm. of regulation. And that's a different sort of argument. My argument is that this is a civil liberties problem. This really guts our, our, our civil liberties. And you take procedural rights, for example. Mm -hmm. um, these used to be guarantees against government. Now these are just another option for government in acting against us because it can act through the courts with due process and juries or simply evade that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, unlike Murray, I would treat this as a civil liberties issue. And that means careful, systematic litigation, not gumming up the works, right. as it were. Um, I, I think a more straightforward attack on this civil liberties issue is to more to the point. Do you, do you think, is Neil Gorsuch uh, truly a, um, is, is he the, uh, you know, the um, deconstructor of the administrative state on the Supreme Court? I have no idea. I, I, my, my only hope for him and all of his colleagues is that uh, they will adhere to the Constitution, including due process and jury rights and the right to independent judgment from a judge, all of which are guaranteed by the Constitution. So you're quite mad, aren't you? Mad? Insane. You know. <laughs> uh, you, a lot of the, you know, your work uh, is informed by this, and obviously even this conversation, uh, there's very much of a Hayekian, a uh, Friedrich Hayek, strain in your thought um, in terms of insisting on rules that are visible and kind of simple and, and everybody has to play by them, as well as the idea of uh, seeking knowledge. I mean, I love the idea. It's kind of a reverse of a Hayekian idea of the dispersion of knowledge. You want to have ignorance dispersed as widely as possible. The ability, it's better to have 500 people making bad decisions than just one. Uh, if uh, because you can counter it more effectively, I guess. But what is your relationship to someone like Hayek or your uh, kind of legal philosophy? Right. So I actually had never thought of myself as a Hayekian, although mm. I, I'm flattered by the thought. Uh, I confess I'm just a lawyer, mm -hmm. and oh, God, this well, is well. But it's, so you're like Jerry Spence, the great. Uh, you know, now I'm not one for <laughs> you know book learning, but. Uh, my interest in philosophy runs elsewhere than yeah. Hayek. It mm -hmm. uh, runs further to the past. Um, but uh, the goal here is actually fairly mm -hmm. ecumenical and simple, mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't involve deep questions of philosophy. Uh, we have a constitution. It's designed to govern us in ways mm -hmm. that all of us can understand. Um, and in its place, we have an elaborate scheme um, in which one scarcely knows who's producing the law, uh, but has limited in input, um, and in which it's applied to us without judge and jury and without due process, all of which were designed actually to limit, the guarantees of such things were designed to limit administrative adjudication. So we're reaching deep into the past of absolute mm -hmm. power, uh, and in fact, administrative power is, draw administrative power is drawn from germ the German version of uh, absolute power. 
So this is a very dangerous mm -hmm. game that's being played, and we should be aware of that and need to fight it. The um, uh, political scientist or historian Arthur E. Kirch uh, wrote in a book called The Decline of American Liberalism that even in the colonial period, um, as soon as liberal rights, kind of classical liberal rights of individualism, autonomy, some, some means of choosing among competing versions of life for at least some portion of uh, the colonists, as soon as those were articulated, they, you know, power was starting to be centralized. That was, it, it was kind of disappearing as soon as it was being said. If it's not, you know, the 1984 Chevron case, if it's not, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson, is there, you know, why do people even bother coming up with a constitution if immediately they're going to start saying, no, no, we're not going to actually live by the rules that we just created. We're going to arrogate more and more power into fewer and fewer hands. Right. So that's actually precisely why I have a we have a constitution, mm -hmm. because we can appeal to it publicly and in litigation to defend our freedom. And the danger is not someone else other than ourselves. It lies within us. The fibs we tell ourselves and that the judges, unfortunately, have come to believe, they're all very principled, but they've come to believe that you don't really need jury rights when it comes to administrative mm -hmm. hearings. You don't the due process is satisfied by an administrative process, uh, that a rule is no different really than a, an enacted uh, statute. And so what we need to do is actually just be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, an administrative rule is not a statute adopted by our, our representatives and it is not legally binding. Mm -hmm. It's a mere command, a mere edict. Uh, an administrative adjudication is not, it has no due process and it ha it's alleged to have a little bit, but it has no due process as was originally understood. Due process comes from the courts. It is no jury. And when the judges go out of their way to accommodate all of this, they end up corrupting their own processes because they end up being systematically biased about the law and the facts. What, what is to be done then? Um, if, if the idea of like massing, kind of, you know, or, or launching massive court attacks against things to at least stop these laws from moving forward, if that's not going to work, um, you know, what, what is the, the best case for it? And what, what is the role of, you know, you're a law professor, what is the role of ideas here as a, or do we need some kind of horrible um, incident where, you know, finally it, it shows how the administrative state is crazy and out of control? Right. That would be, the, Len, Lenin would be happy for that last solution. Right. I, I, I would prefer something much more moderate. Uh, it strikes me that the executive uh, could begin to pull back on administrative power. Whether it will, we have yet to see, but I would welcome that. Um, but in the meantime, we can do much. This conversation mm -hmm. is an opportunity to speak candidly about the problem, and candor is the essence of the solution. And then, in addition, that those arguments that are candid, that say, direct, that say accurately what is happening and what the judges have found themselves to be doing when they go down this dangerous path, that could be brought into litigation. Not massive litigation, but careful, thoughtful litigation that appeals to the judges' best instincts. The judges generally are principled, judges of all sorts, and we have to appeal to their ideals about themselves and show how they've unfortunately departed from those. Okay, well, we'll leave it there. We've been talking with Philip Hamburger. He's a professor at Columbia Law School, and he's the author most recently of The Administrative Threat. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.